on me. And I'm grateful to be joined by two experts uh, who are gonna be speaking with us tonight. Uh, we have with us tonight, uh, Dr. Jeremy Richardson, who is a senior energy analyst with the Union of Concerned Scientists and who focuses on federal climate and energy policy. And we also have uh, Kelly Romer, who is a researcher and PhD candidate at Montana State University at Bozeman, uh, who focuses on creating resilience in rural communities facing economic transitions. So just to give uh, a little background on our conversation, we know that accelerating the clean energy transition to meet the urgency of the climate crisis is a massive challenge on its own but how we get there really, really matters. Um, the other side of this challenge is really, how do we ensure that this transition is fair and equitable for workers and communities around the United States? Uh, many coal communities are already on the front lines of this transition and more communities who are reliant on fossil fuel production for you know, their jobs, their livelihoods, they're also gonna be uh, facing these transition challenges. So really the question uh, at the heart of our discussion tonight is how do we ensure that these workers and communities are not left behind? So I'm gonna turn over to Jeremy and Kelly. We have uh, a lot of questions for you, but I think uh, it would be great to first hear a little bit about what led you to work on this topic. So um, Kelly, would you, would you like to start us off? Sure, and I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining and thanks for having me. Um, I started thinking about you know, rural communities in transition uh, just before I started grad school when I was serving a couple AmeriCorps terms and one was in this remote town in Eastern Oregon that had, um, you know, decades before I moved there, felt the loss of three out of four timber mills. And over time that this, you know, local leadership and regional stakeholders worked really hard to um, figure out what to do next. You know, they have won many awards for their stewardship work. They are, um, you know, pushing for renewable energy development to be the greenest red county in Oregon. And still, when I was there, they're, you know, struggling to recruit, um, you know, new industries or, um, you know, develop um, employment opportunities. And it really got me thinking about these questions about what supports uh, rural communities in the face of economic and environmental uncertainty. And so when I joined Dr. Julie Haggerty's research lab here at Montana State University, that those were the, the questions that we're thinking about and specifically in the context of how are rural communities in the West who host coal plants that are closing, how are they planning for that and what, um, what do they need to plan for? So that has really, um, you know, inspired my, my dissertation research thinking about what supports rural communities in transition. Uh, well, thanks for that, Kelly. And, and um, uh, echo the thanks for inviting me for this event. I'm happy to be here. And thanks to all of you who are doing such great work uh, out in the actual world rather than, you know, inside the beltway. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm Jeremy Richardson. I um, uh, come to this work uh, as somebody who is a, uh, comes from a third generation coal mining family in West Virginia. Um, so when I started working on uh, climate advocacy uh, back around 2007, um, you know, that, that was really the motivation for me to get involved, which was you know, okay, we need to do something about coal, we need to do something about emissions, but, you know, what does that mean for a place like West Virginia that is, you know, so heavily dependent on coal, um, and for people like my brother who work in the mines. So uh, that's just sort of always been the lens that I've seen the entire problem through. Um, and, 
you know, it, it's been really encouraging to me that in the last, really in the last year or two, there's been a, a broad recognition among, you know, environmental groups and climate advocates that this is a problem we need to solve. And, you know, that just hasn't been the case for, for much of the last decade. There's sort of been a few people here and there saying, you know, asking about it or pointing out the problem, but really it's only become a mainstream uh, concept, I'd say in the last year or two. So that's really encouraging and really exciting, but there's still a lot of work to do to, to make sure that we get it right for all of the, uh, all the communities that Kelly was just uh, uh, mentioning. So maybe I'll stop there. I'm really excited to hear your question. Yeah, well, thank you both for, for sharing a little more about your background. Uh, and Jeremy, you brought up how this concept is starting to gain traction or has been in the, in the past few years. So I'm curious for each of you, um, how do you define uh, the concept of just transition? Because it has a lot of different meanings depending on which leaders or which communities uh, you're talking to. Do you want to go first, Kelly, or me take a stab at it? Um, you should go, and then I'll, I'll add you can, on. You can fill in. Um, I use it as shorthand, um, but for a lot of the communities that we're trying to reach, it's, it's a kind of a trigger word. Um, and so EDF has kind of picked up the, the idea of fair transition uh, for workers and communities. And that's something that came out of the uh, Blue Green Alliance process. When, if you look up the Solidarity for Climate Action platform, UCS and EDF are both members of BGA. And <clears throat> that process, in, you know, come, it, it led to a, the development of a, of a pillar um, that focuses on what we call the fair transition, because we felt like that was a little more. It was it was a sort of a phrase that more people could kind of get their their head around instead of sort of immediately being put off. Um, there's a lot of history around the phrase or the you know the term just transition. Um, it really goes back to the 80s when there was a 80s and 90s when there was really a um, a connection between local environmental justice groups um, and workers at individual facilities. There were concerned about particular issues from those facilities. Um, and so it, it used to be an EJ term that was that was inclusive of labor concerns. And I'd say in the last decade or so, it's been a little bit more diverging. So there is some confusion about what is meant by just transition. It means different things to different people. And I would just say, depending on your, just know your audience. <laughs> a lot of times fair work, fairness works better. Um, I, I completely agree. And I think in a lot of the communities that I work, um, the word transition is challenging as well. Um, but one of the, the aspects that we think a lot about in our research is, you know, this idea, this, the process of, um, you know, assessing the impact and planning and then implementing um, transition assistance and strategies. And one way that just transition really fits into that is providing um, or giving explicit attention to equity and justice aspects. And one piece of that that um, is really important is is to be really inclusive about who's participating and intentional about who's in the table and you know in those discussions. I think um, in some of those processes, it might mean um, reaching outside of our of our go tos in terms of when we schedule them and who's at them. Are they during the day? Are folks who work, um, you know? work during the day, they're not able to come, who gets paid to be there, who isn't. Those are things that we need to consider and to be really intentional about um, who gets to be part of those conversations. And um, yeah, part of the conversations and just their 
you know, their perspective, perspectives included in what transition, because one of the questions is like transition to what, and so they need to be part in the process of deciding what that will be. Great, yeah, so it, it really, honestly, it depends on the context and, and who is really involved in that conversation. Um, my next question is, you know, knowing that both of you have focused uh, a lot on co-workers and communities, you know, understanding the challenges that they have been facing and are currently facing is going to be really essential to addressing the energy transition challenge as a whole. So I'm wondering if, you know, at a high level, can you kind of describe what circumstances have led coal communities and regions to face so many hardships uh, over the past decade or so? Um, well, I can speak to some of our work from um, the West and um, right now forefront of my mind is thinking about um, communities in the Powder River Basin. And, um, you know, this the circumstance of a resource region isn't specific, you know, it's not only coal that this happens to. And um, um, when a single industry plays an outsized role in um, the local economy and source of revenue and um, your social and built infrastructure develops around it, it makes it um, really difficult to, to transition, especially when the decisions are being made elsewhere. So um, in the Powder River Basin, the transition is really driven by market factors. And so power plants closing elsewhere in the nation are what is you know, leading to coal decline and in a place that hosts a lot of mines. And so a lot of coal mines are at risk of closure possibly at the same time. And in that we also have, you know, plants that have mines and plants in the same place. And so when one closes, that closes. And so one of the things that we're really concerned about is how these impacts might layer on each other um, with multiple industrial closures. How will that affect, you know, employment? And um, what we're really concerned about in our work is that loss of revenue and um, what that might mean to the institutions and services of that community, your fire departments, your hospitals, your schools, the things that create the social fabric and your ability to be resilient to change or shock or, you know, whether a public health crisis or an economic recession or a closure, things that we're not really in short supply in. <laughs> these days. And so those are the things that, um, you know, we're really concerned about is how um, the, the closures might um, link to a loss of critical services that are really hard to recover once, um, once lost. And there's a lot more to that, but I will pass it to Jeremy because I would love to hear um, about the work in his region. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. I, I don't have a whole lot to add. I, I guess I would say, uh, you know, I, I mostly work nationally nowadays, but I do have a connection to Appalachia and have done a little bit of work there in the past. And, you know, one of the things to know about Appalachia is that these coal mining areas, in, particularly in central Appalachia, have been, um, you know, they've not just extracted the coal, they've extracted the wealth. So a lot of the, it's the resource curse that you were alluding to a moment ago, like the, these places, um, you know, the outside co corporations and, and outside entities have taken the coal, sold it, and then, and then invested those um, resources in the Northeast. Um, and you see a lot of uh, philanthropic organizations <clears throat> that are worth a lot of money now that, it, you know, some of it comes from coal money a century, a century ago. So, you know, Rockefeller Brothers, oil and so forth. Um, so that disinvestment has continued for generations. And, and it means that they're starting from, you know, it's a different starting place in terms of building up the, you know, the workforce and the, the support, the education, the institutions 
um, in the region. Um, so that that's you know your point about the the tax base and, and supporting social services and local local services is is really critical. What I would add to that is that you know a lot of places, um, uh, particularly the ones that are more rural, um, the coal mine or the coal fired power plant, um, it, it might even be the largest uh, single employer in the area. And there just aren't any other jobs around, and those jobs that are around don't pay nearly enough, no, as much as they had been making in in the, you know, in the coal, in the mine or the plant. Um, so it's really important when you talk about, um, you know, new job opportunities to understand that it's more complicated than just going and getting another job. Um, it, you know, you really need to think about creating creating new jobs in those communities that are that have family sustaining wages and good benefits with them. Yeah, so the, the challenges can really um, cascade out from job loss to then, you know, affecting these entire towns and see revenue dry up and, and people start to leave. Um, so kind of understanding how it has this cascading effect, I, I want to turn now to solutions. Uh, and I have a few specific questions for each of you. Uh, so first, Jeremy, uh, can you describe what are, what are some of the essential types of federal policies uh, that you think are going to be needed to support fossil fuel workers and communities? Yeah, thanks for that question. I just dropped a link in the chat to uh, some of you may be familiar with the National Economic Transition Platform. Um, I was one of the people that was involved in that, but it was really led by a group of uh, coal community leaders and, and local la uh, labor union uh, unions and uh, some tribal folks that really came together to try to articulate what the broader vision is that's, that's needed to address this problem in a comprehensive way, right? One of the things that's really confounding about um, the, whole, the whole problem we're trying to solve is that it's just so far reaching. Um, it, it covers so many different, I mean, I just mentioned generations of, of disinvestment. It doesn't take long before you're starting to talk about the opioid epidemic um, lack of healthcare facilities. So, so, it, so that that platform is a good place to start. And if you look at it, they they came up with, or we came up with seven pillars to think about, um, to think about, uh, you know, what uh, what are the broad sets of policies that are needed. So, the first was investing in local leadership and local capacity. Um, the second one was really focused on um, economic development and. Uh, small businesses, uh, entrepreneurs. The third one was focused on workforce um, development. Um, and I can come back to that later because that's what's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, the fourth one was looking at remediation and reclamation. So making sure that we clean up the damage uh, that's been caused by uh, fossil fuel production. Um, and uh, the fifth one was, um, uh, what was the fifth one? I almost had it without think without looking. The fifth one is infrastructure. So there's a there's a ton of infrastructure needs in these communities that range from uh, wastewater, water uh, treatment um, uh, to healthcare to broadband and and lots more. Um, the the next one was bankruptcy reform. Um, so making sure that coal companies have to you know take care of the workers and the communities that they're there leaving and then the the last one was um, making sure that the federal government is effective in coordinating across federal agencies because it's such a such a uh, such a large problem that affects so many different um, agencies and programs yeah and that uh that last one is uh, actually a great segue uh to the next question i had which is you know, we know that support is not just necessary at the federal level, but we also have to really plan for this at the local level. So Kelly, I know your work has really explored planning for transition at the local level. And I know uh, you recently authored a case study on this on Coal Strip, Montana. So I'm curious, uh, you know, from your perspective, what are, what are some local strategies that are really 
needed to effectively plan for uh, the energy transition. Right. Um, thank you so much. And it, um, you know, what what we really learned in doing some of these these case studies and looking at places that host plants that are closing is that they, um, you know, the effectiveness at solutions at the local level is really uh, connected to what, um, you know, what direction and support is at the state and federal level. And so to add to, um, you know, what Jeremy has said, one of the biggest challenges for some of these communities is, is the lack of certainty. So without a sense of, um, you know, a timeline, like if the plant won't close, why should you plan for that? And, you know, the more advanced notice, the better to be able to maybe capture revenue to, to save for a rainy day or uh, prepare your workforce. And also it just helps with your outlook to be able to move forward and, and think strategically. And so um, the lack of policy at the federal level has been a, it's been a challenge and it's undermined planning. But you know, what would be great to see at the local level is you know, the need to ensure that adequate decommissioning and remediation happens. It's, it's really good you know, for public health, but also economic development and potential for some bridging employment opportunities there. Um, one of the biggest challenges that um, we don't quite have a solution for yet or um, that we haven't seen quite yet um, is that need to address the, the loss of local revenues and help secure transition funds. And so um, I spent um, a lot of time talking to economic development practitioners working in these communities and almost everyone I interviewed said that replacing that revenue is one of the biggest concerns that they have and that there really isn't a tool available quite yet to be able to, to plug it in. So, it, and it's keeping them from transitioning because it's kind of an existential crisis if your community is really um, on the verge of fiscal collapse. It's, um, it's really scary. Um, and what I mentioned earlier, there's, you know, there's a need to plan early and plan for long-term goals. And so, um, you know, the, the earlier, the better in terms of um, setting up their strategy um, to, you know, unwind any fiscal dependence they may have and prepare their workforce. And then, um, one of the things that might help these communities in these remote areas is they need to um, engage at a regional level. So to be able to coordinate resources and um, address impacts because why one community hosts the coal plant, several others around it might also, that might be their main source of employment too. So trying to understand how the impact will take place across the landscape and how that might overlap with other vulnerabilities in the area. So we can um, develop targeted uh, strategies for try, trying to mitigate those. But I think, um, yeah, the regional approach would be um, a useful thing in the West. And I'd love to hear um, are, if there are lessons from the Appalachian Regional Commission, because the um, we don't quite have a, a structure like that in place. Well, thank you both for, for your insights, um, kind of at, at all levels uh, where we need policy support. I, I do want to say on this topic of solutions, uh, because looking ahead, I know a lot of the, well, all of the advocates here uh, and many others in this space are really excited about this chance to power up America, which is uh, kind of a campaign at EDF that's really aimed at pushing for clean energy, clean transportation, and clean manufacturing. So, you know, knowing that those opportunities are on the horizon, what do you see uh, the role of those new clean energy and manufacturing uh, jobs playing in supporting uh, fossil fuel workers? I'm not sure if you want me to go first, but I think we've 
been going back and forth of, of starting Kelly so I can take yeah. a Go ahead. Um, I think it definitely can play a role and I think we should definitely be investing in those uh, you know those sectors I guess what I would say is that um, solutions have to be place-based you know they're not going to be they're not going to work if if it's sort of here's the decision from on high and now go in, implement it I think it really has to you know what works in in uh, Boone County, West Virginia is not gonna work in Adams County, Ohio, for example. And so, I, I but I, I would say that there's a huge opportunity in the manufacturing sector because, you know, if you look at Central Appalachia and, and I'm sure Kelly can offer some suggestions from out West, you know, there are, in Appalachia, there are a lot of former strip mining sites or soon to be former strip mining sites that, um, you know, could be repurposed to, to like make stuff. And there is, um, you know, there, there are connections to a pretty intricate rail system that's been there for quite a long time, moving coal out of the area. So, you know, with some forethought and some investments and, and some help to make sure you can train up the workforce, I think there could be a really, I, I think what's really needed is a big success story, um, you know, seeing a big manufacturing facility that's domestic that is in a, a former or a current coal mining or coal you know plant community um and that it's high profile success in the next couple of years i think is really critical to getting that off the ground because for a lot of these communities it's just not real you know wind and solar are things that are happening far away and and that's not us and so it, it's not a real thing um Maybe I'll stop there for a second. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd like to just emphasize for these, you know, the rural remote communities that we spend a lot of time working with is that, is that the geographic challenge of where the jobs are and where they're needed. And um, I think that is a big question that hasn't been answered and will be um will be a big challenge great well uh, uh sorry i was gonna oh, add go it's ahead. like it's like a chicken and the egg problem you know i i met a community college uh leader uh eight years ago and he said look i can create a program to teach people to do anything but i can't do that if there's not going to be a job for them on the other side of that program and so that's where i think there's a role to for the for the government to help connect those two things. Um, uh, sorry, I just add that there is this great report that was just published last week. I'm sure you guys have seen it, but it is from the Labor Network for Sustainability, and it was it was an incredible push for a bunch of um, a bunch over a hundred listening sessions um, with impacted workers and community members and. Um, one of the, you know, challenges that they cited was this sort of geographic, where, where will the jobs be and where are they needed? And one of the, you know, interesting solutions that they had are just thinking, thinking outside the, the main sectors. So maybe, um, providing opportunities where they want to, um, want to get jobs. Maybe that's healthcare and it's not, um, you know, training for jobs that aren't going to be in the place that they live. So I would just, I would recommend that um, report. Great. Yeah, we should definitely um, share some resources after this because I think you guys have named quite a few good reports to look into. Um, another question before I quickly turn this over to some audience submitting questions is uh, another aspect we haven't uh, really touched on yet is how can these different solutions that we've talked about, uh, how can they intersect with environmental justice and help lift up frontline communities and communities bearing uh, the burden of pollution? Um, well, I will... Um, some ways that we, we are thinking about it because we're, um, you know, our blinders are a little bit focused on this, 
on the impact assessment, the planning and the implementation piece of this. And so, um, you know, best practice dictates that all affected parties will be involved in and have meaningful participation in those decision making processes. So um, in indigenous communities, there should be, you know, an opportunity and in intention given to um, um, sorry, opportunities for co-designing and co-leading impact assessments and planning processes so that um, they're appropriate for that community. And um, sorry, one of the other um, recommendations from that report is to ensure that, um, you know, all energy and infrastructure projects be subject to free prior and informed consent, which is to establish a bottom-up participation and consultation with um, whenever a development project decided um, on indigenous lands. And so um, those are two ways that I, I think, um, you know, our solutions can be, um, you know, incorporate some of these um, energy justice and just transition concepts. Yeah, it's a great question, and thanks for asking it and and raising up the issue. I, you know, it's definitely um, something that can improve, particularly environmental justice communities when uh, plants close because it improves local air quality. Um, you know, it, it's hard because it 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 has the effect of of possibly and in some cases definitely pitting the workers against the community members, which is not a helpful way to think about it. So, or is not helpful in moving forward. So I really like what Kelly's saying about, you know, it's, it really just requires robust stakeholder engagement and advance notice and, you know, time to work through the problems and there, there and the issues, the sticky issues. And there are good examples of that. Um, there's a couple groups in Tonawanda, New York that really union and an environmental group that really actually I think they consider themselves an environmental justice group um, that really just put their heads together and said okay what are we going to do about this and, and led to a good outcome like some support from from New York State um, in that transition so um, I try to frame it as potential for um, positive outcomes um, that get that help everyone and a good example is making sure that we clean up the mess that's left behind um, because, and there's some good, really good reports that are coming out of Coal Strip that have really looked at like, what are the costs and job creation potential for making sure that the coal ash gets cleaned up and making sure the groundwater is, is, is clean. Um, so those are examples of, place, of things that, that, of projects and um, concepts that give you both a good environmental outcome, but a, a way for the people that are losing their jobs in these places to at least have an off ramp. Um, you know, you, you don't, it doesn't take forever to clean up the, 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 the um, you know, the mess that's left behind, but, but it gives you that time to plan. I sort of think of it as an off ramp. So it, it's thinking about ways to, to chart a pos positive vision um, that I think can help bring people together. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, it, it sounds like there are some some good examples and models of, uh, you know, how to be really inclusive in the planning and really thinking through uh, all the different benefits that can be offered to communities. So uh, I do want to turn to some audience questions. Uh, one that came in earlier was, what are the prospects for fair transition programs and funds to be included in the upcoming uh, infrastructure program or package? Um, maybe I can chime in because that's been kind of on my brain lately. Um, my crystal ball is pretty dark, so I don't want to prognosticate about uh, possibilities, but I think we absolutely should be uh, pushing for these priorities to be included. Um, so there's a lot of what I understand is there's a lot of conversation about <clears throat> finding a piece of legislation that could pass in a bipartisan way um, over the next few months. Um, uh, 
uh, I've been in Washington too long and and I'm pretty skeptical <laughs> about that. However, um, you know, there are some things that potentially could be uh, moving under regular order. And then the the a lot of the focus has been, uh, could we pass something um, big under a 50 vote threshold, which is how they did the COVID relief package um, last month or this month, I'm losing track of the weeks. Um, but that's this arcane thing called budget reconciliation that I don't, I don't know if people want to go down that rabbit hole. I sure don't. But the point is that, um, you know, that's a that's a way that we can raise taxes, raise revenue, and also spend money on things that are important, particularly for in, for uh, existing programs. So anything that would be useful that is an existing program to have more funding is something that could be on the table to include in a new reconciliation package or an infrastructure package. And so that's a, a lot of the big needs in, in these regions are like building wastewater treatment plants, you know, investing in roads and bridges, uh, investing in electric electric vehicle infrastructure, you know, all, all these pieces that um, you could definitely create grant programs around. Kelly, do you do you have anything to add on that? Um, I don't, I'm a little far from DC here in Bozeman, but um, I've been eager to see the different proposals as they as they come. And so I think Jeremy's perspective is as close as we'll get. <laughs> I, and Jeremy, I'd love to, another part to that question was, uh, how, should, how should our advocates um, here be talking to members of Congress about those potential funding opportunities? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it depends on the issues that you're talking about. A lot of the folks in the regions and in the communities that are affected, you know, may work on one particular thing or one subset of the, the broad suite of issues. So I saw the Reclaim Act fly by here on the chat. You know, that's that's one that's worth lifting up. and. Um, there are many others. I guess the way that I would say it is that, you know, when you're talking to your elected officials about the critical need, the urgency of action on climate, this is not an optional piece of the puzzle. <laughs> like we we can't just, oh, it would be nice if we if we help the people out that got us here. Like it's not, I know nobody would talk about it that way, but but my point is that um, I've just been on this um, soapbox trying to remind our friends in the environmental community that you know th this is not a nice to have kind of concept like we really have to make sure that these regions are made whole um, and it's it's not just that it's the right thing to do but it's it's very much critical to our success in 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 addressing climate so I don't know if that's helpful <laughs> Um, but I could probably ramble on about that for a while, so maybe I should stop. <laughs> no, I think I think that is helpful to to think about it as you know, it's a must-have. This is these communities are absolutely depending on this. Um, so a, another question that came in that I think uh, Kelly, uh, I would love to to point to you is someone asked. It seems. Uh, that unless regions can attract uh, a substitute industry, it'll be impossible uh, to support that same population, at least with the same quality of life. So how can these communities incentivize uh, new industries and new companies to move to these places? Um, gosh, well, I wish I had the, the magic answer to that, but I think, um, one of the things we think about when we're talking about community resilience in, in economic development is investing in the aspects of your community that increase the quality of life for everyone. And um, that is what supports diversification. And so having those, you know, good schools and hospitals and, um, you know, those nice amenities that is um, what supports your ability to weather, weather big changes. And so 
um, and also makes you attractive to other industries or um, folks who want to move to a small town with um, a lot of outdoor recreation. Um, yeah, I think that it is a central challenge and, and some of these communities will have a really difficult time attracting those new industries and jobs and it might um, it might inform how that community or that place or the stakeholders working in that region want to approach transition. There might be opportunities, um, you know, in some places might require more strategic investment to um, support that revenue replacement when it might be a, um, a lot easier to manage in different ways in other places. So to echo Jeremy's point that you know, these need to be place-based solutions and also driven by stakeholders that live there. Jeremy, do you have uh, anything to add on to that? Um, well, thank you, Kelly, for, for that answer. Um, sorry, I just saw a question come in, but I think... I lost it. Someone asked, I think we can make this our last question, but someone asked, how do you um, talk to members of Congress who you know um, pay a lot of attention to uh, either coal or oil and gas industries and aren't really necessarily thinking about the communities, but more so thinking about um, the companies? Uh, I don't know if there's, if you have any thoughts on, you know, ways you can kind of communicate the importance of, of supporting those communities. Well, uh, I'm an analyst, not a lobbyist, so <laughs> I'm not sure I have any wisdom to offer you on that one. Uh, it's completely confounding, and if I could figure out what makes Mitch McConnell tick, I could probably solve all the world's problems, but it, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, I think that one way to do it is, and, and I tell my friends this all the time that are in, um, you know, working in communities, working in affected regions, um, you know, your elected officials care a lot more about what you have to say than they care about what I have to blog about. I mean, it, it's just true. They, they actually have to answer to their constituents um, and so what folks did in the Reclaim Coalition, and this, this has been, <coughs> pardon me, going on for five years or so, they've been organizing around this. They started going to their local uh, governments and getting resolutions passed supporting the, the idea of the Re Reclaim Act to try to put pressure on their, um, you know, their representatives in Congress to like, listen, <laughs> like we really want this, it's important to us. So that's that's really what I would say is, is a good way to, to sort of, if you can make noise at the local level, level um, you can really start to get some traction. Yeah, and the, the only thing I would, um, I'd add to that is just, um, you know, I'm also not a lobbyist, but I think from what we've learned in our work, thinking about what supports communities resilience in the face of big changes is, um, you know, a need for policies that provide some of that certainty. And the more advanced notice, the better. Um, the need for support to address the, the revenue loss as well as, um, you know, workforce training and employ employment support. Um, providing support and access to the assistance that supports early and long-term planning. And, um, you know, the financial and technical assistance there in terms of the, the human capital and, and or, you know, the technical assistance at, at different scales coming in and um, at the regional level. I think those will be critical in supporting resilience in these communities and regions. Yeah, and I think you you just kind of landed on a on a great summary on a lot of the solutions we talked about tonight. So um, I know we're reaching time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. And uh, I think we got a lot of great 
takeaways on you know the challenges that these fossil fuel workers and communities are facing and uh, different federal policies and different local level strategies that can help. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you so much uh, to, to Jeremy and Kelly for joining us and sharing their insights. And I, I also wanna say thank you to the organizers and uh, to everyone who joined tonight for, for really you know, prompting this conversation and, and being great participants. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Chandler, um, Kelly, and Jeremy. That was a really important and um, uh, awesome conversation. Uh, I am going to pass it over to Sydney, our organizer in Colorado, for um, some announcements. Awesome. Hello, everyone. I hope you are as excited as I am to start making progress towards a worker transition to clean energy. Um, with that, we are inviting all of you here today, um, our top EDF Action activists, to become members of our EDF Action Ambassadors community. Our ambassadors community is an online community where you can stay connected with other highly engaged environmental activists, um, connect with EDF staff and experts, participate in discussion boards, and the community is home to one of the best online feeds for up-to-date info about climate issues. And the ambassador community also provides all of our members with tools, resources, information, and a large network of like-minded climate activists like we have here today. And in addition to these resources, you'll also have access to exclusive EDF action events and workshops from experts. We'll have fun events like happy hours, and if you want to follow up with some of the questions and comments you made today, maybe you your question wasn't answered, this is a great way to connect with volunteers and organizers in your state. So the link has been dropped in the chat for you to sign up. It's quick and simple to sign up, and then you'll have access to all of these resources and forums. And if you're already signed up for the community, um, now you can take some time to make a post and introduce yourself in our forums, share why you're passionate about climate activism, or share recent climate news in your state. So that link um, will be dropped in the chat as well, and you can make an introduction post, and we'll all get to know each other a little better in the community after this. And with that, I will go ahead and pass things on over to Jeremy, another one of our organizers. Hey, I'm Jeremy, I'm in the Pennsylvania organizer. And once you've joined the ambassador community, we want you to all join in the next steps of mobilizing broad support by clear, cleaning up our transportation sector and creating good paying green jobs. We're putting a link in the chat that will take you to the action center in the ambassador community. And then you go to take action and you can do that. I think they vote and there we will be able to sign a petition for the uh, EV petition. I looks like they also put the EV petition right in the chat. So you can just click on that and sign the petition, but I really urge you to join the ambassador community and look at the Take Action page every few days. We can new actions, there's also new articles about what's going on, and that will be very helpful. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, awesome, thank you so much, Jeremy, Sydney, Chandler, our panelists. Um, we appreciate uh, all of our participants for taking time tonight to join this important conversation, for submitting your questions. Um, I think if your question didn't get answered to, please connect with uh, one of your EDF action organizers. Um, we'll work to make sure that your, your question is answered. Um, and again, uh, please take the time to register for the ambassadors community. Um, it's a great community where you can stay connected with all the work that EDF Action is doing, um, have, you know, incredible access to uh, a um, great news feed, um, and keep up to date with uh, actions that you can take to help mobilize your communities to support a transition to clean energy. Um, that is it for tonight. Um, I want to encourage everybody to unmute yourself and say goodbye. Um, and we'll, we'll see you at our next event.
Thank you so Bye. much. Bye, Bye thank you. everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Wait, I recognize that voice. <laughs> Happy trail to you <laughs> until we meet <laughs> again. <laughs> Happy trail. We got a singer. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Everybody. Can you sing for the intro next one? <laughs> <It'd be> great. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Well. Thank you. Thank you.